So we covered a lot of material, and I just want to cover some more material, but I'll start with a problem. An object is oriented at 20 degrees, so the axis of the object right here is 20 degrees with respect to the direction of the flow, which is coming in in a horizontal direction. The net pressure and viscous shear force acting, so the net resultant force due to pressure effects and to viscous shear effects is 750 newtons acting at 25 degrees with this flow direction and as shown 25 degrees calculate the drag force and the lift force so calculate f of d and f of l acting on the object i will pause and uh, walk around and see how you do on this problem okay So I checked a few students and a few of you had it right. Of those that had it right, explain your thought process. The drag force is always parallel with the direction of the flow. And the lift is always perpendicular to the direction of the flow. Does that mean the drag force is parallel or perpendicular to a primary axis of the object? No, it does not. So did you use, anybody that got the answer correct, did anybody use the 20 degrees? No. You did not? It's a distractor. It's, it's something to throw you off. It's wrong. Don't do it. Only angle you need is this 25 degrees and the magnitude of the resultant force. So the drag, you decompose to be in the dire x direction because that's the direction that the flow is in. And you just have a little right triangle. It, so it's F of R times the cosine of 25 degrees. And the lift is this component, F of R times the sine of 25 degrees. We're done with that, okay? Okay. A 1.2 centimeter diameter ball is made up of cork. Cork has a density of 240 kilograms per cubic meter. What's the density of uh, water? About 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. What's the density of air? Well, it's right here. It's around 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. It's temperature and pressure sensitive, but the density of cork is in between, so it's 240 kilograms per cubic meter. It will float in water, but it sure will drop in air, right? Density tells you that. Now it's falling freely in air, and the air has a density and a viscosity given. Calculate the terminal velocity of the ball, and then the aerodynamic drag force at the terminal velocity. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to calculate this, All right? So make your calculations for this. All right, so uh, it's easier to solve for part B first, but I like to see a lot of people have drawn free body diagram at terminal speed, at the speed where it's no longer accelerating. Think about, we draw a diagram last time, the speed of the sphere is a function of time. It starts at rest when you drop it, it'll go faster, faster, faster toward the earth, and after a while it'll just level out. That's now the terminal speed. And uh, you have the drag force acting upward because it's falling in the gravitational field, and the weight acting down, W. And so some of the forces, when it's not accelerating anymore, uh, the weight minus FD is equal to mass times acceleration. It's not no longer accelerating. So we find that the, the drag force is equal to the weight. The weight uh, is the mass of the object times G. The mass is the mass density times the volume. The volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed or d over 2 cubed r you need the radius 4 thirds pi r cubed and then multiply by g so a uh, lot of places to make errors but uh, did people get that the weight which is now the drag force is equal to that's a bad looking d isn't it drag force is equal to 0 0.00, .00 two one three newtons not very large got it who got that a couple of you perfect 
that's the answer for part B. Now we move back to solving for part A. We recall that the equation for the drag force is equal to, this applies to a sphere, this applies to a lot of objects, true? You have aerodynamic drag or aerodynamic force over the object. Okay, it's equal to the drag coefficient, area, one-half rho v squared. So this is some special area. It's the projection or frontal area in this case. This is the what pressure? The dynamic pressure the velocity pressure. In that velocity pressure, what is this V right here? What, what is that V? That's our terminal velocity. What is the row? Is the row the cork or the row of the air? It's the air, right? It's the air. And uh, so we already know what this is. Uh, we don't know what C sub D is. And in our mind, we're thinking uh, drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number the, the very low flow, and then maybe get some change in here, and then very high flow. Kind of, we have analytic expression constant over Reynolds number for Stokes flow, and then often we find that it goes to a, a, a constant value at high Reynolds number flow. And if you're in this region, oh boy, it's a function of Reynolds number, and you don't know exactly what it is. You have to iterate if you're doing this by hand or you would iterate in the computer code. Okay, so what I typically do is I can, I'm going to iterate, so what I'll do is I'll say I'm going to guess V. I guessed V to be, um, actually what I did do is I guessed C sub D. I looked at a table, 11.3, and I said, you know, I think the drag coefficient is going to be around 0.2. I think the Reynolds number is going to be up there around 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5. Okay. And so I then was able to calculate the terminal velocity from 2 times the drag force divided by the air density, the drag coefficient, pi d over 2 squared square root. And I calculated that speed to be 12.6 meters per second. At this point, I go back and I say, what is my Reynolds number? Because if my Reynolds number tell me, I can update my value of the drag coefficient, C sub D. So I calculated the Reynolds number, rho VD over mu, and it came in at the 9,670. Well, that's pretty good. It's around 10 to the 4. I wanted to get a little better, and I know that spheres, people have really studied a lot, flow over spheres. So in the textbook, in figure 1134 and actually 1136, where they talk about roughening on it, you can look for, I don't have any information about roughening on this, but I don't think it's high enough Reynolds number that I'm in that area where roughness is going to have a big impact. It's more of a smooth sphere. So I look at it and I update and I find that from this figure at that Reynolds number, the drag coefficient, somebody have the book open to it? Can they find me a drag coefficient at around 10,000? What do you get? Okay, so it's about 0.4. And when I then take that 0.4, it's different than what I initially guessed. So I'll put it in, I'll redo the calcs, I find that the velocity now is 9.0 meters per second. And then when I update and get the Reynolds number, the Reynolds number is around 6,840. What's the C sub D at 6,840? Not too different. So guess what? Box it and call it a day. But if you found that, oh, now I see it's 0.3 or... 0.52 or something, but I think it's pretty close to 0.40, right? And I'm no, I don't, I don't want to try and say it's 0.38, not from that plot or that figure. So I'm not trying. It's close enough. So that's how you would iterate. So let's move on now to flow over flat plate. We talked about this last time. A couple things to remember: 
knife edged so you have no flow coming up like that. You just have flow coming straight across in the X direction. You have a laminar region where you have a developing boundary layer. And that thickness of the boundary layer is defined as the velocity U at the distance Y above the flat plate. When it's equal to the thickness of the boundary layer, we know that it's 99% of the free stream. Let's call this cap V. That's what the book uses, cap V, the free stream velocity, or U infinity, something like that. So it grows, and there's a laminar region. But when it goes so far, if the plate's long enough, it'll actually transition and go into what we call a turbulent region. Right? Turbulent. And what, how do we characterize or say it's, we now expect it to become turbulent? It's when the Reynolds number, as a function of the length, as a Reynolds number defined as the length from the leading edge, x from the leading edge, is equal to rho v free stream x over mu, when that's equal to roughly half a million, we would think that it would no longer be laminar. It would now be turbulent. And in that turbulent regime, you have to remember that there's still a spot of it which behaves laminar, but it's a sublayer. And the rest of the region feels the presence of the plate. So its average velocity is affected, but the severe velocity gradient, if I plotted the velocity profile here, remember it goes like this, 99% that's all V infinity out here. Okay, if I plot it in here, there's a significant gradient in this laminar sum layer, and then there's a smoother transition to the 99% out here. Okay. True? All right. So the next concept of interest was our friction coefficient. What was our C sub F defined at? And we could look at it at the location X. It could be the local friction coefficient. It was defined as the wall shear stress locally divided by one-half rho v squared. So both of those, stress and force per unit area or pressure, had the same units. It's dimensionless. And well, if I wanted to, I could try and tuck a little plot in down here. I'll plot C sub f as a function of x. And it's very, very high at the tip because there's a singularity there. Uh, you know, the boundary layer thickness is infinitesimally small, and it goes, the, the, the wall shear stress goes off to infinity, and so I have infinity for C sub f. But we quickly move away from it, and we find that it drops, okay? It's dropping too dramatically, I think. And then what happens here is, is it's getting a low value, and then it starts to transition. What's what's going to happen as it transitions? Well, um, this velocity, um, uh, large laminar uh, boundary layer over top of the fluid, gave us a, a, re a smaller value of wall shear stress and a smaller value of the skin friction coefficient. But when it becomes turbulent, it's like these eddies out here in the turbulent region, which I'm trying to show like that, are ripping away in that laminar sublayer. That's what they're doing. They're chopping it away. And so what we expect is, is the, the friction coefficient to go up, to go up. And then after it's in the turbulent region, it would slowly, uh, very slowly go down. Okay? But it would still go down. So uh, conceptually, uh, very, very high, going to infinity. Then it goes down as the laminar boundary layer 
increases. Then it goes up because the turbulent is ripping into that laminar part of the boundary layer. And then it slowly go there again. Okay. So we have a, a friction coefficient, which is a function of location from the leading edge. And we already talked about the critical Reynolds number. The critical Reynolds number is half a million. Could we solve for maybe predicting the thickness of the boundary layer, maybe predicting the local friction coefficient, at least in the laminar region? Well, it's in the textbook, okay? It's a couple pages, and I'm going to give you a cliff notes, an overview of it, but it's called the Blasius solution. A man named Blasius did it a long time ago, and it's quite ingenious, okay? It was, it's, it's in every fluids textbook out there, even though it was done a long time ago because of its cleverness and its analytic approach to solving this and because it's such a you know useful result. So what, what do you do is you look at for that laminar region in that boundary layer region conservation of mass applies, continuity equation applies, as well as conservation of momentum or the momentum equation I should say applies. This is the non-zero terms of the momentum equation and this is the continuity equation assuming constant specific heat. So constant, not specific heat, constant ah. density and constant viscosity. Boy, I'm really botching it today, aren't I? <laughs> Sorry. This is a PDE and this is a partial differential equation. Very hard to solve, but he said, you know what? The pattern of the solution of the boundary layer looks the same. If I go down further in the laminar region, it's like it just stretches out. So he noticed a similarity in the solution, and he expected that the boundary layer thickness would be proportional to some fluid property nu. What is nu? Another viscosity. It's nu over rho times x divided by v, square root of that. He would expect that the velocity profile u over cap v would be a function of this relative scaling in the y, the the distance is a function of the boundary layer thickness. So he defined a similarity variable eta. Eta is y square root of v over nu x. He introduced a stream function that's familiar to us. So the u component of the velocity is d psi dy, and the v component of the velocity is equal to negative d psi dy x. I'm sorry, d psi dx. So then you find that the derivative of the stream function with respect to y is equal to v times a function of the similarity variable. So you expect, you just integrate this, separate integrate, you expect the stream function to be a function integral of g of eta, derivative of y with respect to eta, which is square root blah blah blah. There's a couple steps in here I'm trying to just give you a sense of them. So this is the expected function for the stream function. It follows that the V component is here. So you stick the V and the, the U component in to the momentum equation and you get an ordinary differential equation. The two equations, the PDE is satisfied because of stream function for the continuity and the momentum reduces to this nasty looking ODE, but it's not a PDE anymore. It's just an ordinary differential equation. It's got a cubic, so it's third order. And you got F times F double prime. This, this term right here is F double prime. It's nonlinear. So, oh sure, I have a third order ODE, but it's nonlinear. It's pretty tough. Well, if you look back at the momentum equation, U times the derivative of U, that's nonlinear as well. So Blasius said, I think we can uh, transform our boundary conditions. So this physical boundary condition apply, that means that the, the velocity and the y at the surface of the plate, zero, translates to this constraint on f. And u at the surface is equal to zero, no slip. That translates to the derivative of f. And far away, as you go y goes to infinity, the rate of change of u with respect to y is zero. That translates to this. So you have 
third order equation, it's nonlinear, with three boundary conditions. Let's go and solve it. Well, you're going to have to solve it with a computer. Most people do it with a computer. And you can see that example 1010 of your textbook on page 565 gave you the whole solution of f. And then once you have f, you can differentiate it and then take the second derivative of it. And it's a function of eta. And uh, if you take a look, the second derivative of eta evaluated eta equal to 0 is this constant. And you can reinterpret that to say, oh, well, that gives me a constant in front of a uh, shear stress relationship where you have the constant equal to rho v squared over square root of Reynolds number. I left some steps out, sorry. Uh, also, the solution, you take the derivative and you find when the derivative is equal to 99%, you find that eta is equal to 4.91. That allows you to say, hey, the thickness of the boundary layer divided by x is 4.91 divided by the square root of local Reynolds number. So these are big results out of the Blasius solution. You can now interpret the shear stress in terms of a skin friction coefficient, just divide by 1 half rho v squared, and you get 0.664 divided by the square root of Reynolds number. That's all for laminar flow. What about turbulent flow? Well, you, they studied it empirically. So they have data that support, and it's backed up by how they want to curve fit the data. They think it should behave this way. A lot of people investigated it. And the rate at which it grows is about 0.38 divided by Reynolds number to the one-fifth, and the local friction coefficient, a constant over Reynolds number to the one-fifth. So here it is for boundary layer growth, local friction coefficient for laminar. Here it is for turbulent. Those are tabulated and put in your textbook. And uh, I'll stop there. How's that? What we can do is we can integrate to get between the local friction coefficient and the average. This is just doing an averaging. And when you do that for the laminar region, you get that the, um, the average is just 1.33 times the square root of the Reynolds number at L. Okay. And if turbulent, you can do the same thing. Um, here, if you're in the turbulent, um, you have to think about how did I get to the turbulent region. There's always a little bit of a laminar region in front. Um, in order for this expression to really apply, we disregarded the size of the lamina region. We just integrated as if it was all turbulent, starting at x equal to 0. Oh, there you go. Let's solve a problem. For laminar flow over a flat plate, if the fluid free stream velocity is doubled, so we think about we have the velocity new case is equal to twice times the velocity of the original case, subscript 1, original case, subscript 2, the new case. It's our cap V, our free stream velocity, is doubled. Calculate the change in the viscous drag force on the plate and assume that the flow always remains laminar. Okay? Do you want me to give you some time to chew on it? I'll give you a few minutes. All right, so what we're asked to calculate is uh, what the drag force does. So think about the drag force for the new case, compare it to the drag force of the original case, right? Well, what's our equation to calculate drag force for flow over laminar plate? Is it, yeah, it's like some C of F average times some area, it's, it's, it's a flow over a flat plate. So it's the area of the plate, which will be the length times some width, right? And this will be of the new case. This is the average friction coefficient for the original case, length uh, times the width. Now, look at the lengths cancel, the widths cancel. So it's, it's just a, a comparison of, um, I left out another term. I left out the one half rho v2 squared, the velocity pressure, didn't I? And yeah, it's important. 
v1 squared, true? Now also the halves canceled and the mass density of the air or fluid cancels, all right? So what we have is we have, how do we, what is our expression for C sub F in the lamina region? So the average C sub F is 1.33 divided by the square root of the Reynolds number for case two, rho V2 L2, L is the same, divided by mu, and then you have 1.33 square root of rho V1 L over mu, and we still have the V2 squared over V1 squared. We can cancel the rows and the mu's and this L, square root of L, and the constants, and we're left with a square root of V1 over V2 times V2 over V1 squared. And so that's equal to V2 over V1 to the 3 halves. So FD2 over FD1 is equal to V2 over V1. Okay, to the 3 halves. So V2 over V1 is 2 to the 3 halves. So finally, the answer, the drag force when the fluid velocity is doubled compared to the original drag force is 2.83 times larger. So this is a made-up problem. It deals with the hypothetical case of a rectangular trailer following a semi down the road, and the semi is trucking along at 105 kilometers per hour. Okay, and you have the box that's exposed. Okay, and the box has three sides. It has a, 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 first of all, the box is of length uh, 15 meters. It has a height of three meters and a width of three meters, equal to three meters. So uh, in the front of it is some sort of cab with fairings and other things such that I'm not doing a good job of drawing a front of a cab here. That the semi is going down the road. Okay. But the, the air comes along there without any separation at the front. So this is an approximation of flow over flat plate. All right? And you have three flat plates. You have two sides and a top to the trailer. So with assuming no separation and it's all turbulent airflow over the two sides and the top of the trailer, calculate the drag force acting on the top and two sides of the trailer. So what is that drag force, F of D? And then for part B, what's the power required to overcome that aerodynamic drag force? It's turbulent, okay? So we, what we do is we have the C sub F average over the distance from zero to L multiplied by the area multiplied by one half rho V squared. True. And so now what is C sub F average for that box? Well, C sub F friction coefficient average is 0 0.074 divided by the Reynolds number at the trailing edge to the one-fifth power. Where did that equation come from again? Empirical data. A little bit of theory backed up with a lot of measurements curve fit. And so we uh, calculate the Reynolds number, or we need to calculate the Reynolds number to go into there. Well, that's equal to rho V L over mu. I just need to convert that V of 105 kilometers per hour to so many meters per second. I convert it to 29.17 meters per second. 
which seems pretty fast, doesn't it? Somebody want to verify that calculation for me? It's good? Yeah. Then we'll get the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is 2 times 8 times 10 to the 7, 2.8 times 10 to the 7. Look good? Which then we know that it's fully turbulent, we agree. So we're glad we're using the fully turbulent uh, correlation. You get the C sub F to be 0 0.0024. Put that in there. The area is um, the length times 9, or 15 times 3 plus 3 plus 3. 15 times 9 meters squared. The air density, that velocity goes in there, and you calculate the drag force to be not very big. 163 newtons. Now the actual trailer going down the highway is going to have a lot of separation, have a big uh, drag force due to the low pressure behind the trailer. The, the dominant drag force will not be due to the viscous force over the sides. It'll be due to the form drag or the pressure drag on it. True? Yeah. Yep, yep, on the back side. Yeah, and also nothing about the wheels and the axles. That's why they put fairings now underneath to help reduce that drag. And they have on the back side often a little fairing also that deploys, can be deployed and then retracted when you're in a city where you have to back up and unload. Okay, so now what is the... Um, Part B, the power required to overcome that drag, make the power. What is it equal to? The equation? The drag force times the speed of the object through the air, the velocity. And you calculate that to be 4.7 kilowatts. Look good? Done. Okay. Flow over cylinders and spheres, if you have flow approaching a cylinder, if it's very low flow, it sort of slides along and it just comes together again. The pressure here and the pressure there are the same. Stokes flow, it's only viscous drag on it. The drag coefficient, C sub D, for low flow is, is a constant over the Reynolds number, right? Stokes flow. But as you start to increase, What's happening is, is it's harder for it to come back in this region right here. This is a region where it's called an adverse pressure gradient. What happens is the flow is fast, it's trying to slow down, and flowing into a region of higher pressure. <laughs> it's adverse pressure gradient. It doesn't like to do that. It would like to like skip it. And so what naturally happens is, is you eventually start to shed vortices and you get vortex shedding for laminar flow. Yeah, the von Karman vortex street. It's like a, they shed off. Then as you continue to increase the speed for flow, what will happen is, is you'll get a separation point develop, and you'll get a wake region. And now it's more severe of where it was at the beginning, all viscous drag. Now you have a lot of form or pressure drag on it. You have a low pressure region on the back side with recirculation. Okay. And then as the speed increases, the size of that wake increases. All right. And then it, as the speed continues to increase, not only is it laminar flow over here, but what will happen is, is the, the separation region will become very large, but it'll trip to be turbulent early. And when it trips to be turbulent, it actually w helps reduce the size of the wake region and reduces then that area where you have a low pressure on the backside and reduces the net pressure drag on the cylinder or on the sphere. All right. So when you plot 
the drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number. You get a region, Stokes flow. It starts to belly off, right? And then it, it can come out and you can get some drop before it goes like that. And what, what is the explanation of this drop right in here? It's where it turns turbulent, trips the turbulent right in that vicinity and helps negotiate the turn because it's turbulent, reducing or delaying the separation point and reducing the size of the wake behind and really reducing the pressure drag. How many people enjoyed reading that section of the textbook? How many people anticipate really enjoying reading that section of the textbook? Yeah, it's really a very interesting phenomenon. And so if it is the aspect that the boundary layer turns from laminar to turbulent in this region or somewhere in here, that helps reduce the drag, clever engineer says, I'll trip the boundary layer, trip it. They'll put in some surface roughness to help promote turning turbulent, but not so much surface roughness that, you know, you mess up a lot of other stuff, like making it um, non-spherical. You put dimpling on the golf balls or other things, okay? That helps promote. The dimpling is not to do anything but to help promote the turbulence earlier onset of turbulence than what it would be if it was a smooth ball. So if you have an earlier onset of turbulence, then it goes through this region earlier at a lower Reynolds number, reduces the drag force for a longer flight of the ball, and the ball goes further when you hit it with the same speed, right? I know if you really whack the ball, you can make it go further, but after a while, let's say for the same impact, boom, it's going to go, but if you now put dimpling on the ball and you whack it with the same impact, that ball will go further than a smooth ball. We have a air and it flows over a four centimeter diameter, 40 meter long pipe with a velocity of five meters per second. So you could show the V coming in, five meters per second, the long, long pipe, and it's now cross flow over that pipe. And uh, you want to calculate the aerodynamic drag force exerted on the pipe. So this generates a net F drag force on the pipe. Well, the equation for the drag force is some drag coefficient, go get it, times the area, the frontal area, times one-half rho V squared. You use that equation so often, boom, you know it, right? And so for the cylinder, it's going to be the diameter of the cylinder times the length will be that frontal or projected area, d times l. Why not pi dl? It's not pi dl. Don't put a pi in there, right? It's a projected area, frontal area. Yeah. Drag coefficient. And this is where you go to the table, and this is where I was looking at my notes previously wrong problem, right? This is the 1.2 for a high Reynolds number flow over the cylinder. Let's calculate that Reynolds number. Reynolds number based on diameter, rho V D over mu, and we calculate it to be 12,406. Well, yeah, that's over 10,000. It looks like it's used the value out of that table, which is uh, 1.2, it's over 10,000. And then we just stick in the velocity pressure you make this calculation, and now the drag force is the 28 newtons. Good? Yeah. Pretty straightforward calc. Which did you say that's from? Uh, table 11.2. So it's for a cylinder. Now they show the cylinder is vertical, but it doesn't matter. But the length to the diameter of the cylinder is long. So it goes to about 1.2 for the drag coefficient. 